Okay, so we're recording this for those that picked F9. So who's a planner here, a buyer, an inventory manager? Okay, who's here for the just until I get that moving? <laughs> okay. I can ask, so why are you here? Because you have to do that every time I'm here. Yeah. Okay. So. No, no, no. So really the, the purpose of the training uh, today is to help you understand what IPR does. Now, we, it, the, the, it, up here on the board it says demand planning. We will cover demand planning a little bit, but this is a tool for inventory replenishment that you can use with or without the demand planner. And the demand planner is a forecasting tool. It's a demand management tool. So uh, I want you to understand what IPR can do for you and have a, an idea of the scope of the implementation effort. So in addition to, uh, hey, here's what we'll do for you, here's the magnitude of the undertaking if you decide to implement this. And then, of course, if I can't answer your questions. So then as we go, ask questions. Otherwise, uh, we'll go to the very end and, and run out of time for questions. We'll have to write them down, and that's not as good as answering them in front of everybody. So the scary slide here kind of puts into perspective where IPR fits. So on our whole planning spectrum, we have a forecasting tool of that planner, and that can feed into the natural schedule. Who is using the natural schedule here? Okay, great. The master schedule then can feed MRP. It can, you can use planning networks, so you can do multi-site MRP, especially if there's an order of precedence, a sequence of events that needs to occur. And then, of course, that MRP, it manifests itself with not order proposals, but where are they here? Somewhere, to, oh, they're not even out here. There should be another little box here, requisition. So you're going to get your purchase racks and your shop order racks. Does the screen look frozen? It's just me. Okay. So when we talk about IPR, not everything has a demand for the master schedule. So it, it focuses on what we call the reorder point item, those that don't have particularly a dependent demand, and they would manifest themselves as order proposals. So that's where IPR fits in, is to help you generate those order proposals in advance of the typical reorder point functionality. Who's using reorder point functionality today? Don't be shy. Yeah, I will call on you sometimes, maybe not. So, and I heard uh, that it worked pretty good here. You made some tweaks. What were some of the tweaks you had to make? What were the shortcomings? Um, with dates, the default in 365 days, our identity of your purpose rent. So we changed a lot of when we know product's going to be here 14 week, week time, or 14 day week, week time. We changed that to 14 days. Um, and then depending on what the item is, if we had an order point too high or too low, um, I'll tweak that when it tells me, hey, I need to buy more of these. I'm like, well, we haven't sold much. I need to change some of those points. How about lot size and stay on stock? Yeah, lot size. We don't really need to take stock here. Okay. Um, we do use the lot size. So you need to get all those in order. What happens if you have, let's say, B time of zero? B time of one? What does that do when you have a real order point item? You can get that tomorrow. Well, can you? From what you told us out in the shop, nothing can be here tomorrow. Now, if it's from across the street, that might work. And that's what I usually find is reorder point. It works or it doesn't work because, well, lead time is not proper or, or the trip point is not proper. So IPR addresses a few of those issues. So how does it do that and who is it designed for? Well, on the left-hand side, you see that supply lead time and then you have the delivery lead time. That's what your lead time in IFS for the part needs to reflect. It's that sum total. So IPR, inventory planning with punishment, is reorder point based. It only works on the items that are B, coded B. It does not work on the A's. However, there are some analytics that will advise you perhaps you should switch from a B to an A or an A to a B. That's one of the benefits of using the tool. It will take a look as it starts getting more history accumulated. It can help you decide if it's time to switch a reorder plan item to an, a, an MRP type item, or vice versa. Um, 
So that second bullet, the demand for parts, depends almost entirely on other parts. This is what we call dependent demand, and MRP is the best tool. Because you always got demand driving the replenishment, whether it's manufactured or purchased. So there's always a demand and not getting. If the part's got that third bullet, if it's got many sources of demand, real to point might work better. Uh, there's also uh, an instance here where you may not have any demand at all. It's uh, sporadic. Maybe it's a service part. So those are hard to predict, especially if you're not forecasting them. So let's go further into why we want to use this. Well, maybe we have uh, we have an inventory buffer. Uh, number two, maybe the demand is independent. In other words, it just comes from out of the clear. It's not uh, a lower level item on a bill of material. It could be a service part. It could be uh, something uh, out of the blue. And uh, that third condition is what we call decoupling. So the, the demand might be from an external supplier. And usually it's where we have spare parts. Uh, it's where we have high distribution or it's where we have uh, common components used in a lot of different bills of material. And sometimes there's not always demand for all those parts. Uh, so demand may be high for some end items, maybe low for other end items. So even though it might be an MRP part, MRP might not give you the whole solution. So what is it? First of all, let's take a look at what reorder point is. So whether you use safety stock or not, there's always a safety stock element. So what happens is when you fall, I mean, this is classic ATIC stuff, but it, I think it's worth drawing the contrast. So you have a, a, a restock level. When inventory falls below this level, then you're going to get a trigger out of the order proposal. And you might use safety stock to accommodate further usage of inventory until you get that receipt in the inventory. So that's why it's important to have a correct lead time and a correct safety stock and a correct reorder point. So what's the disadvantage with having reorder point? from a standpoint of how it works. What triggers it? It's when inventory falls below that level. So what if I have 50 on hand and my reorder point is 45, and I get an order for 10? What happens? Well, oh, come on, there's only two answers, nothing or something. <laughs> Actually, nothing happens, and that's part of the problem. Nothing happens because we haven't changed the on-hand position. What happens if you reserve that item? We don't care, so to speak. Nothing happens. It's tr the trigger here is, what do I have on hand? And until that on-hand changes and falls below that reorder point, order proposal does not appear. So that's part of the problem, which is, you know, if we don't have the reorder point high enough, if we don't have any safety stock, if the lead time is way too short in the database, then you're between a rock and a hard place and it's time to order that thing. So how do we accommodate that? One of the things we're doing is we're going to try to uh, figure out the next order date. So we're going to, using a number of different mechanisms, we're going to try to determine when you would anticipate falling below that reorder point. So how do we do that? We're going to take a look at your supply and the large and, and forecast an actual demand over time. So we're going to start trending what you've been doing for usage on this part. So if you have um, an average usage and you figure out what it is monthly or whatever your uh, lead time horizon is, we're going to figure out how many issues you might have of that in that lead time to figure out, well, this is when we expect over time, as we move on this horizon, when you might fall below that reorder point and give you a message. Actually, before order proposal runs, you would give you a line item in the supplier part window. And there are a couple new columns on there. So on that overview supplier for purchase part, where you can create the requisition, you're going to see a select order date and uh, the actual order date. We think we should launch it. So what we've done is turn reorder point into something that has an element of forecasting. So even if you don't have any history and you give us an idea of what you think you might be using for this part without demand planner, 
we can make an attempt at giving you early warning on when you might fall below that quota point. So then, of course, I wrote a proposal. That's still the same old background job. That's going to compare available stock, whatever is available, to the reorder point, and then it would create requisitions for you. Now, when when rows show up in this overview supplier for parts, you can always create the reps from there. And what you'll see is I usually condition code uh, the days to next order. So if it's within, you know, 10 days, 21 days, whatever the shortest due time is, then I kind of color them so that I know when I look at that window here in the 10, i got to look at because they're in yellow. Or if something's past due, these are the ones in red. Somehow we missed them, and they should have been ordered yesterday or before. I have a question. So if you don't issue the part, like on a shop order or to the customer on reserve, and I get below my order point, but it's not because the inventory it hasn't been used. Right. Is there any way to... I like an item I always use on shop bills, but I have 50 shop bills open and none of the rest yeah. of the stuff here. But I want to buy more because they're all going to be gone. Is there any way to get well, around? Well, one of the things I'm working on with R&D is setting up a parameter to ask can we consider available instead of on hand. Because there are many IFS customers that will reserve that inventory knowing they're going to do it. The current philosophy is yeah, but you could also unreserve that, and now we've told you to order stuff you don't need. That's the rationale. To so, so as long as it, if we can make a parameter, we can control whether we consider uh, whether it's available or on hand, that would work better. So then the next question becomes, well, is that a site setting or is that a part setting? And now if I do it at a part, well, guess who has to do a lot of maintenance? So. This is an Kanban, and Kanban can get, it's, it's, uh, you can resize your circuits in IFS if you have demand. So it works well if you have something in a master schedule or a customer order backlog, things of that nature. But if it's not predicted, right. you're in the same boat with right. Kanban. So that's why the IPR might be helpful. So what does it do? We're going to calculate these four values for you. So it depends on some kind of forecast, and I'll, I'll talk about that more in, in, in a moment. It can be a full-blown forecast out of master schedule or demand planner, or it can just be, here's our guess at an annual usage for this part. So if you wish, well, I first going to calculate, but if you wish, it will update records in the planning tab and inventory for you. So safety stock. Maybe it's too high, maybe it's too low. Reorder point, again, maybe it's too high, maybe it's too low. Lot size, again, maybe it's too high, maybe it's too low. It'll give you some information in that regard. Probably the most important thing is, this is our best guess at the next order date 
given the current stock level and your forecast. So a way to accommodate these these reserve materials but not issue them to shock orders is, well, let's just forecast what we're going to do for the year, and we'll figure that out on a weekly or monthly horizon, whatever works better. And how does that lock on things looking at minimal quantities from the product? It does not. It does not. So, so you have a standard lot size. We're using that one. But you might have quantity-based uh, price breaks. You may have minimum lot size. So to make this work and conform with what you're doing with your suppliers, that lot size should be at least the minimum supplier lot. So we have... Four factors that we're looking at. Uh, lot size can be defined by time coverage. Is anybody using MRP code G or planning code G? All right. So, okay. So code G. So the way MRP works by default when you use code A for a punishment. If I have an order for five every day of the week, and I'm saying, you know, code A then how many orders am I going to get? Because I'm lot for lot. So I have five demands each for a quantity of five. I'm going to get five orders, five apiece. But if I use this time coverage or in um, the planning tab, it's code G for a punishment, it says, well, I want you to group them together to cover a period of time of that demand. So instead of five orders of five, I'm going to get one purchase order, one shop order for 25. It'll group them all together. You can do the same thing here. When we're doing reorder points, we're leveraging what you could do with MRP to accommodate. We don't want to have tons and tons of individual requisitions. We want to group them together. You can also use a EOQ, or you can also just specify, here's the lot size you period. For safety stock, same thing. Do we want to have it cover a period of time? Do we want to enter something manually? Do we want to use... Uh, a couple of things that will uh, require demand planner for, one of them is called uh, historical uncertainty, and there's also something called MAD, or the average deviation of demand period to period. So those are, we'll cover that more if we need to learn more, we can always talk about it uh, at a break. And then the reorder points, is that going to be manual? Do we want it to be lead time driven? So based on how, how big or small this is, it will drive the reorder points. <coughs> And then we have, if you use demand planner, we have four different planning models or algorithms to handle slow moving parts. And that's really what it was designed for, uh, as you'll see in a moment here when we talk about the background. So to make this work, we have an assortment classification because different parts have different histories, different demands, different life stages. Uh, we have something called policy-driven planning parameters. I'll show you that. There's the integration with demand planner, uh, and it is designed for high volume, but we have some special models, again, for slow movers, and those might be service parts or highly seasonal parts. So, for instance, uh, we have many customers in uh, forestry, ag, construction, and so on that use uh, IPR to replenish their parts, you know, when, uh, when May, June, well, end of the month May comes along and you have uh, somebody in a field, you know, trying to plow and they need a, a transmission or something else, that tractor's down unless you have those parts on hand. So that may be something you replace, you know, once every five, six, ten years, you need to have those parts there. So, and this first came out in 7.5 SP5 as an extension. Now it's core product. So one more time, the safety stock, your point lot size, next order date. And then something that's really neat is it, it was like um, in school, you didn't get credit unless you showed all your work. You know, well, yeah, I know the answer is four, but show me how you got to four. So we heard that enough from our customers, like, well, how does this work? What's in this black box? So we have a, a spreadsheet that's produced for every part that is controlled by IPR to show you what the input parameters are, what the output parameters are, and then we actually get a synthesis in another slide here. Uh, actually, I'll get there in a moment. Uh, but it, it's a it's a what if spreadsheet as well. And every time you recalculate IPR, you get a new version of that spreadsheet for every single part. 
So in the uh, overview, uh, and by the way, this is the in nine thing. Who's on nine? Sorry, let's do it the other way. Who's not on nine? Okay. So when you go to nine, you're going to see this word overview just disappear. Suddenly everything will become uh, plural. So we have supplier for purchase part, and then we'll have, instead of overview, we'll have suppliers for purchase part. So uh, don't be panicked if you think you've lost a bunch of screens. They're just not called overview anymore. So there are a couple new columns. Here's the next order date, and then day to that next order date. So, uh, and I didn't tell us code before I took the snapshot. But what I would normally do is highlight anything that's negative or zero in red. Those are problems already. And then something that might be greater than zero but less than, you know, 5, 10, 21, whatever your shortest lead time is, it could be in yellow, which means, all right, I, I need to start looking at these. They're on the radar. And everything else, in a way, you can ignore. They're just sitting there waiting for time to pass. So next order date is that date when a part we think will reach that rear point based on your uh, drawing down of inventory. And uh, the date, the next order date, that column there, is really the priority of how you handle these requisitions, either to the shop or well, to, the, to the supplier. So here's that worksheet, and it looks busy, but it, don't be daunted by it. So we have all the calculation details here, so they're all labeled to show you here's your lead time, here's your service factor, here's, we can even for EOQ, here's your cost and order cost, multiple lot size. And then we have columns, B, C, D, E, and so on. And those show what you had in your inventory planning record that went into the formula and what came out of IPR as a result. So this first tab down here will show the part record. And that shows the calculation uh, and, and everything that was controlling how IPR worked. Then the second tab shows all these different values. So. Here is the lot size portion. Here's uh, safety factors. You order point all these different uh, sections show you the input and the output. And then you can use column C to see what would happen without actually have to go through changing values in the planning tab for the inventory part. So, for example, if we decide, well, we're going to change that order cost from 10 to 20, what would happen? And we're going to see, well, since the lot size and EOQ, there will be a change in that lot size, and in fact, there is. Because you said, based on the EOQ, we just change the cost. This does not take effect, but if you decided to do that, then, you would map, then this would be your result next time you're on IPR if you made those changes in the planning tab on the inventory part. Same here, if we change safety stocks. To uh, time coverage from, we want to cover twice as much time, so go from five days to ten days, uh, to cover to draw down the inventory for twice as long, then we, because we have safety stock to time coverage, then that safety stock almost doubles. Actually, it does double. So it's showing you what would happen. And then, of course, uh, one of the ways that you can plot these things is just now that you're in an Excel spreadsheet, you create your own graph. You would have this spreadsheet. You would have us. Yeah, you would have a spreadsheet for every part, and then you would have these three tabs on at minimum. There's some. There are some changes coming in in whatever comes after nine. Uh, don't know what those are going to be, but there are some other things coming. So, um, we talked about the parameters enough. So, how do we set this up to make it work? Well, we need a number of these parameters. We need how are we going to express demand? Because remember that, that what IPR represents really is a order point, but with an element of demand forecast. So, we need to identify where, what model we're going to use for demand, what model will we use for safety stock, for lot size, for order point. And then we may have these three settings uh, to also consider, especially if we want to use EOQ as a calculation. So in the interest of making it easier to implement uh, our, at our software, <coughs> R&D came up with what we call an hierarchy, uh, a planning hierarchy, where 
we can set parameters across the board for ICR at a company, at a site, at an AMC code, at an asset class, quantity group, even supplier. So that when you go into an inventory part and say it's now a B, replenishment code, it will inherit these values. So you don't have to, let's say you have a thousand parts that are real point. Instead of going into a thousand parts and setting all these parameters, and they're probably about 30. So that would be 30,000, you know, entries. All you would have to do is set up this planning hierarchy and then go into the thousand parts and switch them to B. Well, of course, the way you would do that is with the Excel add-in for ISS applications, you dump the parts into a spreadsheet that you want to change, change them from whatever to a B, send them back to ISS, IPR runs, and it does all that work for you. So we try to make it, you know, automatically set up for you. So let's take a look. So the values then, and we'll take a look at the software. There are a couple of other things, a couple other tabs here. But when you go to the planning tab, when ICR is installed, you're going to get a new order flip tab, and it'll have all these values. And then notice over here on the right-hand side, the operative value source, nothing was entered at the inventory part level for this inventory part. All we had to do is change it to a B. These four values, the, for, the demand model, the forecast, the safety stock model, lot size and VOQ, order uh, point is mean time driven. All of those came from the ABC, uh, and I'll explain the frequency uh, and life cycle later, but it's coming from that table, and then all of these values here came from the company table. So setup is quite easy. So the workflow then would be, you know, which, which um, how, how are you going to categorize uh, your different parts? Then you would group those parts uh, so that you can set them up uh, from A to B or whatever they happen to be right now to B. Uh, you trace the demand forecast, you would calculate planning parameters, and then you would execute the replenishment. So once you get things set up, you're kind of in this loop right here where you trace the forecast, and then as these, over time, as more history accumulates, you're really right here. And this then becomes an overnight process to calculate planning parameters. So that every day you're just coming in to take a look at what's been recommended for replenishment and then acting on it. So, you know, the implementation part is from here to here, and then periodic is right here after you get it set up. Uh, that's a little too busy. That's just the technical uh, infrastructure. So, talk about the, the classification of parts. The reason we do this is because we may want to identify spare, dispense, trade parts, manufactured parts. We may want to identify different parameters for them differently. <clears throat> so within, and, and we may have different life cycle stages. So if we're introducing a product, if a product is declining, if it's a cash cow, they're going to have different demands and different usages and different terms. So depending on where they are in the life cycle, your replenishment of those items will be different, right? Some will be you know, you'll be ramping up, you'll be maintaining, you'll be ramping down, you'll be, let's get rid of this stuff. This is the, actually we have a method for that. So, so we have LIFO and FIFO, we also have FISH. Anybody use that? First in, still here? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we can categorize <coughs> um, by site, by as the ISS class, and then we can define our ABC classes globally. So you have, of course, the ABC class, we have our part planning methods, so on and so on. So if we go <coughs> to take a look at ABC, you know, it's the standard Pareto. What we're trying to figure out here is, well, which ones are A's and B's and C's because these are the really important parts that we have to make sure we don't run out of. And, you know, sometimes many C parts are critical, but they just don't have the expense or the use as other parts. So there's a planning method for each one of these. So we have, you know, the classification defines our, our focus in IPR. And here's how that works. <clears throat> so based on ABC, we also take a well, not based on ABC, but in addition to ABC, we'll also take a look at is frequency. So if we have fast movers, 
and they have, you know, pretty average demand, they're pretty easy to forecast, right? We know, you know, based on what we've done over time, we're probably going to do that, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, but those are pretty safe to forecast. So predictable demand, easy to forecast. But these slow movers, these are the ones that, well, what do we do with these things? How do we figure those out? So our frequency class helps us decide the best forecasting method that we would use in demand planning. And that's why we're doing that classification. So it all comes down to this. We have a classification in the ABC. We also have it in the frequency. So we have uh, also one third element in the, the life cycle. So it could be in development. It'll be coming in the future. We have the, an introduction. We have a mature product. We have a declining. We have an expired. And you set some census here to indicate how IFS would determine this is its life cycle based on the usage of that part in the last X days. So if you have not used an item, let's say, in five years, that's your parameter, then we would say, well, that's, in our terms of IPR, that's an expired part. But if it's something that you've had no usage in the last 60 days, then it could be declining or it could be mature. So those are all factors that you set. And what happens then is it serves two purposes. So if we're, you know, a cheap but fast mover, <clears throat> well, it may not matter very much if we sometimes overstock a little bit. It may, be, it may make more sense to buy that in larger quantities because it's lower admin uh, costs for uh, purchasing and receiving. So, yes, yeah, those could be, you know, it's a, it's a C part, it's a slow mover. Maybe that would stick out as an absolute part. So in addition to figuring out replenishment, we're also trying to stratify inventory here for you so you have another profile of what's happening in your inventory that you can take other actions besides replenishment. And then the, <coughs> the uh, A items and the slow movers, those are important but they're tricky to plan. So we, again, we have a method in the demand planner to plan for these items. So again, we're going to classify, this is a new feature in IPR, it would run in the background. Um, somebody had mentioned out on the tour, there's a bunch of, sometimes you have a bunch of records that are, uh, there's nothing on hand but they show up in stock status with a zero quantity on hand. That's one of the cleanups. So when you schedule that, you would probably also schedule this classification. It's a background job and it just runs periodically to do this. Calculate the frequency, calculate the ABC class, and calculate the life cycle. So when we come down to a life cycle, we see that it's a new part, then you're going to have to give us a manual estimate of the demand. When we see that it's a mature part, we suspect that there's probably a reliable forecast we can use from history. And if it's <coughs> declining and expired, by default, we're probably not going to replenish those for you. So when we go through all that analysis and setting, what you'll see now on the inventory part record on the general tab, you've got these columns or these cells right here. So here's your ABC class, here's your frequency class, and here's your life cycle stage. So already, just by running it, it shows that this vodka absolute is a fast mover and it's a mature product. This is from a customer in Sweden. This is real data. I got a question. So you have to figure out what the frequency class is. Do I need to put parameters in here? Because most of my car is based slow moving. So there are yeah, any parameters. Yeah, the, the default, I believe, if you do nothing, is that it's a, uh, actually, I forgot where it is now, but the, the slow mover is probably the default for your version. So yes, you would have to set parameters that indicate, and I have a screen come up to show you what that is. You would have parameters that indicate if I've had no transactions in the last X days, then it's this stage. If I have no transactions in an even greater period of time, it moves to the next stage, which is mature, then it moves to declining, and then it moves to expired. So you have to figure out for, and it's probably not by part, it's probably by maybe accounting group or product code or, or asset class that you would set those uh, senses for the uh, life cycle stage. So the planning parameters. When we want to set the demand model, 
So to calculate the planning parameters, we have to have an idea of what you plan to do at least this year for this part. So again, you can give us a yearly prediction using a manual entry on the plan.